Anna Jambik from the University of Georgia, distinguished guests from the U.S. Consulate General, esteemed members of the faculty and administration, dear students. Good evening and a very warm welcome to today's Institute Lecture. The Institute Lecture Series of the Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology, Shikpur, comprises six orations in a cycle and commemorates some of the greatest Indian minds. Today we have the third edition of the Vishweshwaraya Memorial Oration after the name of Mokshagundam Vishweshwaraya, an outstanding engineer and nation builder whose birthday is tomorrow, that is 15th September, the day that is celebrated as Engineers Day all over India. This lecture has been organized in collaboration with the US Consulate General, Kolkata. It is to be delivered by internationally recognized marine waste expert Dr. Jenna Jambik from the College of Engineering, University of Georgia. Before we proceed further, may I request Professor Chakraborty and Dr. Jambik to be please seated at the dais. Students will now offer floral tributes to Professor Chakraborty and to Dr. Jampik. Now very briefly about M. Vishweshwaraya. Mokshagundam Vishweshwaraya was born on 15 September 1860 in Mysore. Upon graduating as a civil engineer from the College of Engineering Pune, Vishweshwaraya achieved celebrity status when he designed a flood protection system for the city of Hyderabad. Among his other major achievements, he developed a system to protect Vishakapatnam port from sea erosion and supervised the construction of the Krishna Raja Sagar Dam across the Kaveri River from concept to inauguration. He was also the Diwan of Mysore from 1912 to 1918 and was called the Father of Mysore where he was responsible for the founding of a large number of institutes, factories and other industrial ventures. He was known for his sincerity, time management and dedication to a cause. Vishweshwaraya was appointed a companion of the Order of the Indian Empire and was knighted as well. After India attained independence, he was awarded the nation's highest honor, the Bharat Ratna, in 1955. He was awarded, awarded honorary membership of the London Institution of Civil Engineers and a fellowship of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He was awarded several honorary doctoral degrees and was president of the 1923 session of the Indian Science Congress. He passed away on 14th April 1962. He lives on in the hearts of the innumerable people whose lives he bettered and the Vishweshwaraya Memorial adjacent to his house in Mudanahali is regarded as a temple by the local people. I would now request the Honorable Director, Professor Partha Sharati Chakraborty to address the audience on this occasion. Sir, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Jambek from College of Engineering, Georgia Tech, and my esteemed colleagues and dear students. As has already been explained that uh, by Professor Aparna Degros, it's explained that uh, we organize a series of institute lectures. The objective of this uh, institute lecture is to expose you to the issues, challenges, and some some topics of general interest, which is outside your curriculum, and to know the latest trends, what is happening in the rest of the world. So it is something beyond your textbook, and in order to create an environment, better academic ambience 
for the institute. These series, institute series lectures were originally thought of conceived as, and this is the third in the series, I think, and this is to commemorate the birth anniversary of one of the greatest mind of this country, Vishwasaraya, who is recognized as the, an engineer, the best engineer, the first engineer of the country in a way. And we celebrate, uh, tomorrow is his birthday, and we celebrate as engineers throughout the country. And he has a scintillating uh, biography which is read right now. Uh, you must have understood. And in names of other other uh, sons of uh, this uh, India, uh, we organize similar kind of lectures. And today's topic, I guess, is related to environment. Uh, and I think pollution, plastic pollution in ocean. And uh, Dr. Jembeck is an uh, expert in this area. So it's a privilege for all of us to listen to her. And uh, I believe that uh, this lecture, uh, you'll enjoy this lecture and you have something to take away from her, which, which you are not probably aware. And we normally do not get an opportunity to interact uh, people like this. So this is a great opportunity for us. And I believe you are not here today to listen to me other than to Dr. Jambe. So without wasting any more time, I'll uh, request uh, Dr. Jambek to deliver this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I would now request uh, Professor Onikman Gupta, who is Head Department of Civil Engineering and also winner of the Institute Lecture Series Cell to introduce the speaker today. Thank you, Professor Aponnandi Ghosh. <coughs> this year, the World Environment Day that we celebrated in Ayashti Shippur, all of you know the theme was Beat Plastic Pollution. So it's a privilege for us that this year, the Visheshwaraya Memorial Oration, the topic that we are fortunate to get from Dr. Jambek is on plastic pollution. So this is apt in every year and perhaps more apt for this year. As it is mentioned or it is indicated in the slide, she is associated with the University of Georgia in the teaching faculty and also she is the director there in the, in the Center for Circular Materials Management. She specializes in waste management, solid waste and her work on these solid waste and plastic waste, so to say, has influenced many of the policy discussions, policy declarations, including G7, G G20 declarations. And she's also recipient of several medals. One of them is University of Georgia Research Medal. And she is very active. She travels all across the globe in many countries. She is the international informational I think speaker on behalf of US Department of State, that's why she travels all over the world on her official involvement and also that's a fortunate aspect for all the countries to hear more about the plastic pollution, the problems of other kinds of debris as well. And I can find from her biodata that she sailed with 13 other women across Atlantic collecting data on the plastic debris on the land and the surface of the ocean. And that was having another objective also, uh, to inspire more and more women to come in the field of STEM, science, technology, environment, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So she is very passionate about going with all of us for more deeper exploration of the science. As and you can find on the uh, projection here, she is the National Geographic Explorer. National Geographic Explorer is in essence is a big kind of exploration ship. But otherwise, the National Geographic Explorer, there are few persons who are recognized by the National Geographic Society as National Geographic Explorer. And today, before coming here, I was trying to find out what exactly means or essentially means as National Geographic Explorer. Before finishing, I will mention, I will quote from that. Every National Geographic Explorer is infinitely curious about our planet, 
committed to understanding it and passionate about helping make it better. And every National Geographic Explorer is making an impact on our planet. So we are indeed very fortunate to have with us Professor Jambek. And again, no more wastage of time. I will call upon Dr. Jambek to please deliver it about the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you very much for hosting. Um, gosh, it's really my honor to be here for this memorial lecture, um, and, and uh, especially one about the first and most well-known engineer within India. So, um, anyway, I'm sort of overwhelmed by all of the all of the um, lovely situation today. So. All right, well, let's, let's jump into what I'm going to talk about. Uh, plastic in our ocean, science and solutions. Um, although you heard quite a bit about my background, I want to talk a little bit more about um, what I've been doing for over 20 years, which is working in solid waste management. <clears throat> and um, I want to talk a little bit about why I picked solid waste management. So as an environmental engineer, we can work in uh, drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment, uh, air pollution control, storm water. Um, but in my, where I went to school, which was the University of Florida, um, it was often these uh, water choices. But when I took my solid waste class, and many of you have maybe been impacted by a certain professor teaching a class, um, the way the class was taught and when I learned about really our management of solid waste and um, people's sort of reaction to the waste that we generate, um, I was fascinated. Uh, at the time, we were trying to site a new landfill within our community and um, people chose not to expand the local landfill but to build a transfer station and ship the waste <coughs> as far away as possible. Um, and that sort of, again, fascinated me because we all are generating waste, but yet we don't really seem to want to manage it near us. Um, so I have been able to travel the world and really have amazing and rich and deep experiences learning from folks um, managing our waste around the world, and I'll get deeper into that um, as we go through the lecture. But it was really 2001 when I heard about our waste ending up in the ocean. And I was just starting my PhD, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is, what, this, this is what I need to research. I had a deep love of the ocean, love of the environment, had you know sparked my interest in trying to manage our waste. And this put both of those things together. I thought, if our waste is ending up in the ocean, then I think we might be doing something wrong on land. What's going on? Um, so my advisor at the time, it was actually the same professor who taught the class that inspired me to go into solid waste. He said, I don't really know much about this. I think you should talk to someone in marine science. Um, so I just found a, you know, somebody who was in marine science, and I went to them for some advice. And I said, this is, this is what I, I want to research. I think this is a, a problem, and I really want to research this uh, for my PhD. And his reply to me was, nobody cares about that. And, my, and I thought, well, <laughs> okay, um, I didn't expect that. I thought maybe there would be other challenges, but I didn't expect that he would say nobody cares. Um, and so obviously I think the, my look on my face was a surprise. And he said, well, okay, maybe if you're in Hawaii where plastic does wash up on the shore, or if you're in Alaska where there's a problem managing fishing gear, um, you know, those might be okay, but here, uh, I, in the state of Florida with a large coastline. He said nobody cares about that. Um, so needless to say, I, I couldn't research it for my PhD. I found another topic um, sort of fitting more into environmental engineering at the time as well. Um, but I did start doing this research on the side. So um, this might be a lesson to those of you uh, in persistence and how you can make things work because certainly today, I would say that people definitely care about this issue. So um, it started off looking at all materials um, ending up in our ocean, just in general, our solid waste, but it's really moved to focusing on plastic. And the reason being is that 
This is a fairly, a relatively new material for use. Um, it's changed our lives. Um, it makes our society what it is today. It's in our electronics. It's in our, um, we use it for medicine. And of course, it's been used a lot in packaging. Um, and I think we can't really imagine our lives without this material. But it has increased really, really rapidly. Um, and anything we cr increase rapidly in uh, production uh, increases in our waste stream. And so our waste stream is really an illustration of what's happening in our society. So we started recording how much we're producing in 1950. Um, and cumulatively, uh, well, so it was only 2 million tons in 1950. Most recent data um, is that we were producing 335 million metric tons in one year. Cumulatively, this puts us at 8.3 billion metric tons by 2017. Um, this is equal to about 80 million blue whales, um, which is also a hard to imagine. But because about 40% uh, of this is used in packaging um, or single-use items that go into the waste stream fairly quickly, that means that over 6 billion metric tons has already become waste that we've needed to manage. Now, what have we done with that waste? Well, globally, on average, we've recycled only 9%. Of course, this varies country by country. Um, and from what I hear, India has probably a higher recycling rate than that. Um, we've incinerated just only about 12%, which means almost 80% is ending up in our landfills or on our land in our environment. Um, to note here is that this is projected to increase. Um, so continuing sort of that increasing annual production means by 2050, we'll have a cumulative 12 billion metric tons of plastic waste to manage globally. So this is an issue that is uh, not going away, and we need to uh, think and be innovative about uh, solutions. So what also makes plastic different is that it doesn't biodegrade, and what it does over time is uh, fragment into smaller and smaller pieces. So I did a beach cleanup on Sunday um, in Chennai, where I was here before this, and somebody said, what is the most common item you found? Um, and it wasn't an item, it was actually fragments of items. So it was these microplastics um, and plastic fragments. So microplastic are about the size of a pencil eraser and smaller. Um, but when plastic is exposed to UV light um, and also other weathering events, um, in the ocean, of course, there's got wind and wave action as well. It simply fragments into these smaller and smaller pieces, oftentimes then getting to pieces um, that we can't even see anymore with, with a microscope and then potentially even smaller than we can detect at this point. We also know that plastics in the ocean sorb uh, principal organic pollutants like pesticides, um, flame retardants, and uh, they act like sponges for those and then sort of are, have then with oceans being sort of the ultimate transporter that can get transported um, around the world along with the plastic. So we also have a few things that are microplastic as they enter the ocean, or as they enter our environment, I should say, um, and then they have the potential for reaching the ocean. So in some products, we have microbeads. These are products that often say they have cleansing ability, um, and they have, for slight abrasion, then they have these plastic microbeads. So if you look on the label and it says polyethylene, um, then these, these cleansing beads um, are made of plastic. And of course, those are washed into wherever you're washing uh, your face. Um, and same thing with um, synthetic clothing. We see microfibers um, coming off of synthetic clothing, especially fleece clothing. Um, again, wherever that washing in the wash water is taking place. Um, some of these are captured by wastewater treatment plants if wastewater is treated, um, and, but if it's not treated, then they go into the environment. And these are banned, though, in some countries around the world, including the U.S., um, but they are not banned globally, um, the microbeads. So where does the plastic go, then, once it enters the ocean? Um, some of it does sink. Some of it is uh, more dense than seawater. Some of it floats, um, and so what floats on the surface often aggregates in these five gyres around the world, um, and it's floating as a fragment oftentimes. So this is where the microplastic will aggregate, and scientists have gone out and sampled um, 
the uh, floating microplastic all around the world. We also know that some of it accumulates even in areas where there aren't people. So they've now found that microplastic heads up into the Arctic. Um, they found it in sea ice. They found it in sediment. Um, also, some of it gets spit back out of the ocean, basically, if there are islands sort of interrupting those currents, those transport currents, then it gets spit back out. When I was in the Canary Islands, I walked up to the ocean and I looked down and every wave was bringing a confetti of microplastic onto the shore. Um, and that was really a significant moment for me in my research as well. Um, inspired me to continue. And then we also know that conduits for mismanaged plastic waste on land to get to the ocean are our rivers and our waterways. I personally grew up on a river in the state of Minnesota in the US. Um, and I basically spent many, many, many hours and days within that river and love that river and those are transport and conduits um, for trash and plastic to make its way to the ocean. It's also been found on the bottom. Um, as I said, some of it sinks and some of it gets colonized bacteria and the density changes and, and sinks to the bottom. So even in you know places where we haven't been yet, pretty much everywhere we look, newly look, we find plastic. So what are some of the impacts? Um, the, the two most well-known and I think documented for the longest period of time are ingestion and entanglement. Um, interestingly enough, when microbes colonize some of the plastic, it actually smells like food to seabirds, um, but also their feeding habits, so skimming the surface of the water where the plastic is, uh, they end up consuming it. Albatrosses specifically can eat this and bring it uh, home to their young where they're trying to regurgitate food and feed their young and then that can contain plastic that they're feeding to their chicks. Um, it doesn't biodegrade right, so it doesn't digest, it doesn't provide any nutrition, it can fill their bellies and they can starve to death. Larger plastic items like fishing gear um, also entangle, I entangle animals, and so I know that um, there's a large fishing industry here and when this material ends up uh, in the ocean, animals can get killed and um, it interrupts their regular feeding habits, etc. So we also know that some of the microplastic, even those microbeads, can be consumed by the tiniest animals in our food web. Um, and so that food web also contains us. So in 2015, um, lots of people have been looking at plastic in our environment. So oceanographers, marine biologists, you know, sort of exploring and finding it in our environment. But I was in an international working group with many other scientists from around the world, interdisciplinary group. This is really an interdisciplinary problem. Um, and we asked the question, well, how much is actually going into the ocean from land? And there's more than one source, but we had a feeling that our waste that we generate every single day as a person, um, you know, our daily waste generation, municipal solid waste generation, um, is likely a fairly significant contributor. So we went about going to quantify that. So this was a group that was meant to do data synthesis, meaning we weren't allowed to collect new data, but we had to take existing data and put it together to come up with these kinds of estimates. So we looked at 192 countries in the world that have a coastline. And then from there, we took a 50 kilometer buffer of that coastline, meaning proximity would matter for this plastic waste to make it to the ocean. Um, and then we looked at the per person waste generation rate, the quantity of that waste that was plastic, then the quantity of that waste um, that's actually mismanaged or littered on the land. Um, and then from there, we had three scenarios, a low, mid, and high scenario of plastic that actually then would enter the ocean. And if it's mismanaged on land, it would have to be blown or washed into a waterway right there that leads to the ocean or blown or washed directly into the ocean. Um, so our mid estimate of 8 million metric tons um, hard number again to imagine when we just kind of hear these numbers, but if you can think about it, it's actually equal to about a dump truck of plastic going into the ocean every minute for the entire year. Um, just to note in terms of, as I said, scientists have been um, looking at the quantity of plastic floating on the ocean, and of course this is 
empirical data that they've collected and then compiled and been able to make some of these estimates. We're looking at about a quarter of a million. Um, this may have been updated to maybe about half a million or so of the small plastic pieces floating out there. So we think there's eight million going in, but there's only um, a much smaller fraction actually floating on the surface. So I want to go into talking about what we can do. So now we kind of know what the problem is. We know about this one source of plastic entering the ocean and what can we do. So actually 13 years ago was my first trip to India um, to visit solid. I went to a conference in Bangalore and then was able to visit um, solid waste management facilities. And um, these kids were working on uh, recycling. I assume this was an informal recycling sort of village. Um, it was actually in between Agra and Delhi. Um, but as we think about solutions to this problem, it's not just technical. There's many, many intersectional issues related to this issue. And um, I always like to say this, there's people behind these numbers. Um, so not only people working within the solid waste system formally and informally, but then people generating the waste in the first place. Um, so that we really need to look at um, techno-social solutions. So this is a framework that I developed um, specifically for uh, testifying to the U.S. Congress. Um, and as I was thinking about it, the solutions are different around the world, yet can fall into a general framework that hopefully can inform and provoke thoughtfulness around potential solutions. So if you look at, and this also kind of followed from that infographic, right? Because I was thinking about, well, if we could decrease any of those columns that were in that infographic, um, then maybe we could have reduced the quantity all the way to zero of plastic going into the ocean. So let's say this is zero. Um, it opens up sort of all these opportunities here for being able to have an intervention or a solution to reduce the quantity of plastic going in. Um, so let me go through them in a bit more detail. Starting all the way on the left, we're going to start kind of upstream to moving downstream. Um, so, you know, demand is projected to go up. We know that solid waste generation rates increase with economic growth. But is there a way to um, reduce demand? And that can be through personal choice. This research really illustrated to me that these personal choices that we make make a difference because population density was a huge driver. I wasn't necessarily convinced of that when I started this work um, because it just seems like, well, what could, you know, what does one choice that I make? But as soon as that's taken collectively with a lot of choices, it absolutely does have an impact. Um, but notice I have the word luxury up there. It's those of us that really do have the luxury of making those choices. For us in the US where we generate at least double if not more than that per person of many countries in the world, we have a responsibility and a mission to reduce our waste generation to help on this issue. I think others as they can if you need clean drinking water in water bottles, and of course that's what you need to be having. Um, I think especially here, um, some conversations that I've had with folks have revolved around plastic bags um, and necessarily the need for those. I know I've We've discussed a lot about um, flooding issues related to trash and especially um, plastic bags and the environment can clog drainage systems. And so talking just about some immediate health issues of mismanaged waste there. So next I think we can think about how do we um, use technology and kind of meet people's needs and uh, increase livelihoods. Um, and have economic growth, but not necessarily produce as much waste. So can you decouple that waste generation rate from economic growth? And I think we've seen a lot of technology where we uh, don't need to purchase items, but we can meet our needs, say a bike share, a car share, um, even a tool share, clothing, rental. I, I actually rent clothing, so I rented the shirt. I decided to buy it, but if I didn't, then someone else would have worn it. Um, and so it's basically kind of like a clo clothing share. Um, I think there's opportunity to think, apply the same sort of philosophy to packaging or to delivering food, um, which is where we see a lot of the plastic packaging. Um, even here, um, we, I talked to some folks who were talking about like a water ATM. If you need clean water, you can get 
clean and filtered water from um, like a vending machine and have an RFID cup that's associated with you. That might be one example. I'm sure what I'm hoping is that students and the next generation of folks are going to think about some really creative ways that we can do that. I also think we need to think about designing products for management at end of life. So I've been chatting with some recyclers here and also around the world. And if products are designed so that it makes it easier to recycle, um, it helps tremendously. It means they have more value. And it means if they have more value, they're not going to end up le leaking into the environment. Um, and so thinking about non-toxic additives, thinking about um, adhesives that are easy to get labels off, to thinking about um, more homogenous materials used in products. It means they have more value, they will get recycled. Um, there is a, an amazing recycling industry within India, and again, things that have value get recycled. This is also where we could bring in industry <clears throat> and those folks designing and developing these products. If they use end of life as another um, component to how they're designing their products, then we can be much more proactive with managing them. So bringing everybody to the table here is important. Um, we're trying this, we're trying to show this or be an example of this ourselves at the University of Georgia. So my colleague who's a polymer chemist um, and works also in our biochemical engineering program, um, it, developed the, or started this institute. So together we're at the New Materials Institute. He is the director. He's developing new materials um, and new products. And I'm at, at the waste side going, okay, I want to test those for biodegradability if that's what we're going for, or imagine and think about the impact that these new products and materials might have on the waste stream. Um, and so one material that he's working closely with is PHA. Um, and this is a biodegradable polymer. Um, it's made from a microbial process and um, they're using canola oil as the organic substrate for this polymer. And we're testing it for biodegradability and it's being developed for different applications. It's a bit more like paper in terms of it will biodegrade if it gets wet and it has, it's exposed to microbes. But um, it also acts like a plastic and looks like a regular plastic, so it can be used for regular polymer applications. This is now at the pilot scale, so um, I'm expecting maybe about five years from now. Hopefully we'll see PHA on the market. So kind of thinking, if you can imagine again, that uh, framework that I had up there coming down a bit further or about right in the center. We talk about improving waste management infrastructure around the world. And in general, that means collecting, capturing, and containing our waste. Um, but this might look different uh, in different locales. So I visited some of the um, largest dump sites in the world. I visited the largest landfill in the world, um, actually in South Korea, um, which was uh, which is not pictured here and um, barely even looks like a landfill, but this is one of the um, largest dump sites in the world. And so we're talking about um, making sure that we don't see leakage of materials from these. They are oftentimes, lots of people are picking through the trash. And so in many cases, we see a lot of recycling, but again, not everything is valuable and not all, uh, everything is captured. And so we're trying to figure out how to work within those systems, re-engineer them so you've got proper um, landfilling scenarios, and then also working with the independent and informal waste collection community, which is often hidden from many people and not well understood and not well documented. Um, and also the junk shop owners here, the Kabadiwala, um, they play an important role in actually managing our waste. Uh, we just spent some time discussing source segregation. So here are actually some informal collectors who have now become home waste collectors, but the recyclables and organic are all mixed together. So it's extremely hard to get the recyclable material out. They don't have as much value because they're mixed with the food waste and they're very wet. Um, and so source separation is important, whether it be home composting or industrial scale composting, and then the recyclables are clean and dry and have much more value. If you want to move closer to a circular economy and circular materials management in a community, you have to be doing that. Um, 
there are some U.S. companies doing some interesting work. They're taking what's called ocean-bound plastic, and so it's really taking my research and looking at the plastic waste that's generated near the coastline that could make it to the coastline, and using that in making products and selling them to people who want to buy ocean plastic tennis shoes from Adidas, ocean plastic jerseys. Um, the computer uh, shipment material can be made of ocean plastic, and this is from Dell. And so those companies doing this um, really sort of catalyze the development of infrastructure, which is the key for me. Um, you know, some people say these solutions are just sort of small, but I think if they develop the infrastructures, which is what we need, and it gives the material value, which is what we need, then we're not going to find it um, leaking into the environment. We use a lot of GIS in my work, so a lot of this data is really important to be mapped. We publish a, a white paper on the, um, on the status of this issue and waste management within the continent of Africa. And so being able to use GIS to uh, communicate sort of what's going on around the world has really motivated countries, regions, um, and other uh, communities to make change. And, and work to uh, raise awareness and address this issue. Um, but I think what I've learned in terms of working with National Geographic is that maps and storytelling are very important as well as this documentation. And so although I've worked and done a lot of global compilation of data, um, I know because as an environmental engineer, my focus is usually a municipality and municipalities are where we decide and we make these decisions on waste management. So we can have these global initiatives, efforts, and campaigns, yet I know where the rubber hits the road is in the community. And so right now my PhD student is working to develop this uh, circularity community assessment protocol where we're sort of looking very holistically at communities and how um, plastic materials come in, how they're used, and how they're managed at end of life to be able to figure out what can a community do. This is a question I get when I travel. What can we do about this? Um, so hopefully we'll be able to look at this. Um, it's sort of under the umbrella of the policies that exist, the economics that exist, the governance that exists, and then our influencers, our uh, NGOs, academia, citizens, industry, and also the government. So those are all the folks that play a role in that. Um, and so um, this earlier this year is when I became a National Geographic Explorer. It's very exciting for me. And my initial project is to work with the independent waste collectors in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. They are actually entrepreneurs and they go house to house and collect waste every single day. Um, but they are not recognized by the government, so the government also collects waste in other parts of the city, but these folks have a challenge because they are entrepreneurial, they're providing a service to the government, um, but they're not recognized and that leads to some difficulties in their ability to operate, but they're certainly providing a service and so helping to document, tell their stories, and um, figure out how to, how to scale what they're doing actually to help on this issue around the world. So finally, um, our last chance, so right before plastic waste gets the ocean, can we capture it one last time? And this is where my students have had fun. So I usually give them this framework in our sophomore design class and say, pick somewhere, pick an intervention point and pick a design and create that for this class. And they spend a whole semester doing that. I've had several groups think about this last chance capture and engineering a capture device. So this is a really simple, fun device. This is Mr. Trash Wheel. Um, there also is Professor Trash Wheel, and that's a woman, and she's down, down the river from this. Um, but Mr. Trash Wheel basically has these booms that float on the surface of the Baltimore uh, Harbor, and then the river, base, the river current brings the floating trash uh, to the booms, it travels down, and then it goes up the conveyor belt. There's a water wheel that helps to operate this. There's solar panels, and there's a dumpster in there. Now, of course, last chance capture, you have to have somewhere to take that waste, so this um, waste can be properly managed in the U.S., but of course, if you didn't have all of that upstream infrastructure, it, there wouldn't be much point to um, doing this last chance capture, or at least it would be challenging to manage that waste without any other infrastructure. So besides engineering solutions, um, we can use our two hands. Um, 
So I did get to do a beach cleanup. Actually, tomorrow is the International Coastal Cleanup Day, uh, sponsored by the Ocean Conservancy, and that's been happening over 30 years. Um, and so it is not, you know, as I'm saying, this is integrated solution approach. This is not the only solution, but is one of them. Um, because we, we always are having some leakage, then being able to collect it before, the, before it gets to the ocean is important. Um, but what I see as an opportunity with these cleanups is to collect data. So as a scientist, as an engineer, what I want is more data to figure out what's actually going on here. And so in uh, 2011, sponsored by the U.S. government, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, Marine Debris Program gave us a grant to develop Marine Debris Tracker. So this is a mobile app. It's free. It's available on any Android, Apple device. Um, anywhere people see litter in the world, whether you are way inland, our biggest individual trackers in Omaha, Nebraska, on the coastline. Um, so our biggest community tracker is Jekyll Island in the state of Georgia, so they're right on the coastline, or in the open ocean, um, you can collect data. You simply, with a few taps um, in the app, you send the data to our global database, um, it's open source, it's open data, so you can access your data um, almost immediately and access the global data set to be able to see what people have been finding, where they've been finding it. We have a virtual community um, on Twitter at Debris Tracker and also on Facebook. If you are an individual tracker, you start out as a starfish, but then you move up in your um, marine species as you collect more data. And have a little animation here that we did in GIS. So this is also where we use a lot of GIS. You could imagine um, being able to intersect this data with other meaningful data in GIS, like maybe stormwater outfalls, um, land use activity, um, weather events, right? So we've got ways, once we have this data, to temporally and spatially analyze it. and. That's been really important, so I had a master's student just do that, and she was able to um, predict where and, uh, well, locations of hotspots of debris on Jekyll Island off the state of Georgia. So there's other, there's two other messages I have here, and in case you can't see the legend, this is the um, type of material. We're not just looking for plastic, but all of the materials in this um, a data card that uh, NOAA helped us, or help NOAA developed, that we put into the app. And um, so these other two points I wanted to say is, remember when I said your individual choices matter? Well, you can just imagine if this was all individual people going out and collecting even one item, the impact that it would have. Um, and also the individual choices matter over time. So the first one is individual choices taken collectively. The second is over time. Our largest tracker in Omaha, Nebraska, has been using it for over five years, going out one or two days a week and collecting litter and collecting data, and that's been over 86,000 items then. Just one person deciding to do that over time it makes a huge difference. So the choices that you make certainly matter. Um, and so to me, it's really just important to have data. These can be data for local solutions, and of course, it feeds this global database um, that we can look at as well. So you probably saw the little dots crossing the ocean on that animation. Well, that was me uh, sailing from the Canary Islands all the way to um, the Caribbean. It took 19 days um, on this 72-foot sailboat. I did have 13 other crewmates, all women. We were uh, sampling the surface of the ocean um, for the floating plastic that was there. So we were basically at the southern end of the North Atlantic gyre. Um, and we did all of the sailing ourselves. So I had never been on a sailboat like this. And first trip was all the way across the ocean. Um, it was a huge, huge uh, emotional and physical challenge for me, probably the hardest thing I've ever done um, emotionally and physically, but um, it was amazing. And so we sailed and did the science. Um, about four hours a day I was doing science on the boat and reporting what we were finding there, developed a new microplastic sampling method and using Marine Debris Tracker. 
uh, the entire time. So um, in the introduction, you heard a little bit about how some of the research and data that I've collected has fed into some of this global policy making and declarations, but I just wanted to say what you all might be doing here or what people do locally is fitting into these global efforts. The UN has a Clean Seas campaign. Um, there's large uh, NGOs that have international reach. We've got um, the World Bank. There's a lot of investment going into this um, into this issue, and I'm just really, really grateful for the State Department um, for sending me to many, many countries where I'm not only talking with people, I'm learning. I get to hear what the issues are, and um, you know, share experiences from country to country around the world and really try to come together to figure out um, how to, to solve this problem. So at this point, I just wanted to say um, whether or not you're a movie star, I should find a movie star from India in here, shouldn't I? A prince or some of the many, many students that I've met all around the world, some of the waste workers that I've met around the world, or my 10-year-old son, I think we can all make a difference on this issue. Um, and I hope you have some questions as well. Thank you very much. If there's time, maybe there's not time for questions. Yes. Electrical? OK. Um, so good question. I think, um, well, let me just tell you a bit about my collaboration with my computer systems engineering colleague. Um, I don't know that he ever thought he'd be working in waste. So to create Marine Debris Tracker, I even just, I just ran into my colleague in the hall and I was like, hey, if we had an app and a million people around the world were telling us that they found a piece of litter, would I like break the internet? <laughs> Not really break the internet, but you know, I was talking about our servers and he's like, no, that'd be fine. And what are you doing? And so then I told him, he's like, well, I can help, you know, build that. So um, I think sort of getting out of your box and chatting, you know, with people. So maybe, you know, like if you look at Mr. Treasure, let's say, and, you know, that obviously had a design um, that maybe needed some electrical engineering. But if you think about, you know, automating some things that we see here, they're also talking about like flying drones and collecting data. Um, I don't know, it's kind of like wide open in terms of, I think this field definitely needs, you know, technology. So as an electrical engineer, I, I feel like there would be somewhere we could contribute. Um, I don't know exactly what your specialty is, if it's building circuits or, or what, but it's a very interdisciplinary issue. I feel like just about anyone in any, um, because there's social issues associated with it as well as the engineering and the science. So um, keep the discussions going and you know, try to find yes, others sir, even outside your field interested and I bet you'll come together with an idea. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm from architecture department and I was wondering what happened to those waste that sunk, you know the heavy plastics you talked about earlier mm -hmm. and did they also break into uh, microbits and uh, if they did where did they accumulate like mm -hmm. is the ocean floor also affected as well as the coastlines and the coral reefs what about them yes oh that's a great question thank you yeah, so the, they did find that there, the plastic that did sink, especially on the coral reefs, I'm glad you brought that up because I hadn't thought about that in a while, there was um, increased disease uh, in coral reefs that had plastic on them. Um, so that is an issue. And so you're right, you know, it's sinking to the plastic, to the, excuse me, sinking to the ocean floor um, <clears throat> where plastic hadn't been before it certainly is gonna have some sort of impact there, right? Because it's something that wasn't there before. Um, you know, that plastic bag that was on the bottom of the ocean looked a lot like a plastic bag. So I think we know that the microbial environment down there um, is different and, and there's a lot less, I think, 
ability for things to degrade down there and also because it's not exposed to light. So I think you're, you're right in that probably things would stay more whole on the bottom of the ocean. And uh, ma'am, what about the volcanic activities? Will they degrade the plastics over there? Or mm. will they get stuck on the ridges? Like, are there initiatives on this matter? Thank you. Not that I know of. I don't know that I don't know that anyone's ever asked that question. Um, yeah, I don't know anything about that. So on the ocean floor volcanoes, is that what you're talking yes, about? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Or yeah. in the reefs, like mm -hmm. uh, Mariana Trench or something like that. Right. No, they have found it at depths, at depths. Um, yeah, I think in the Mariana's Trench they have found it now. So it's everywhere. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm okay with awkward silence for a while because I teach college students, so. <laughs> I know. We'll give, we'll give you like, you know, 20 more seconds. <laughs> then they're like, oh no, 20 seconds. Any questions about the boat, sailing? Or, yeah, we were also obviously promoting women in STEM. I can see here, looking in the audience, that women are a minority. <laughs> At least in this room, for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's typical for me in engineering. Good evening, ma'am. Uh-huh. My name, I am from Mechanical Branch. Ma'am, uh, I have heard uh, scientists are de uh, developing uh, some uh, plastic-eating bacteria. Yes. So, if they are allowed to, uh, such a bacteria are allowed in the oceans, can they bring change or they affect the ocean environment? Mm -hmm. I want to know. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, they have, you know, and it was actually at a recycling facility where I think the bacteria evolved to be able to eat the PET. Um, there's also some plastic eating worms that have been found and um, a fungi. So, and some of those have been genetically modified then beyond that once they've been discovered to actually treat the material. This has all been at the lab scale only. Um, I certainly think that if we genetically modify something and then also put it in an environment where it wasn't in the first place, that we're, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to engineer something and then kind of put it in the ocean. Um, but I do think, I guess, if you were going to try to, I mean, I think the biggest hurdle with those is application. Where would you apply those? Would you just make a big, you know, reaction tank and put all this bacteria in there and add the plastic? That's about all I can kind of think of for an application. It seems quite cumbersome. And um, but I don't know. Maybe that there would be a place, a remote place that didn't have any way else to manage the plastic that that might work. Um, but those are really, they're really interesting research findings, I think, but they're really only at the lab scale right now, and application is the biggest question. Where would it be applied? Thanks. I'm doing my master's in environmental engineering. Oh, great. So, um, what I want to ask is, uh, there was an incident where uh, uh, there are NGOs that work up for cleaning the beaches along the coastal regions, particularly in Mumbai. So, uh, what they discovered was uh, most of the waste that comes out is plastic. They've cleaned up the beach, but what can be done out of that plastic? Because uh, if nothing's done, that still persists in the environment. So, it defeats the whole purpose of cleaning. Yeah. So, uh, what can be done to uh, what is collected out? Because if that can be sorted out, then I think plastics will de uh, the uh, will reduce in the environment. So, what can be done out of what is collected out? So I think yeah. So that was kind of my point when I was talking about Mr. Trash Wheel collecting the plastic right before it gets to the ocean. But you need to have somewhere to manage it upstream as well. 
I mean, I think there's still a point in cleaning the beach because then the plastic is going straight into the ocean right there, right? So it's it's good to pick it up off the beach no matter what. However, that in the waste management infrastructure needs to be there, whether that be uh, landfilling, um, thermal treatment. I mean, that's really your two choices for plastic um, at this point in time. So what we like to say is that we really like those upstream solutions to happen so that we don't have the plastic end up on the beach. But certainly you want to clean that beach and then develop an integrated solid waste management system where hopefully we're separating the organics, keeping the recyclables really clean so that they can be recycled. It's fairly challenging. I guess I said landfill and thermal treatment only. Sometimes if the plastic collected from the beach is still clean enough, it can be recycled as well. Um, so I failed to say that. But it, it can be challenging depending upon how long it's been in the environment. Um, so moving back upstream, we just we'd like to institute that integrated waste management program and, and kind of turn off the tap of the plastic getting to that beach in the first place. Is, does landfilling help? I mean, uh, plastics are not biodegradable, so right. will landfilling any help in any way? So um, it does as, as long as you have an engineered landfill facility that keeps the plastic contained. So remember, I said capture. Uh, or collect, capture, and containment, um, in this case, that will keep it out of the ocean. It will not biodegrade, as you say, so it will fill the landfill and it will still be there. Um, but it does keep it out of the ocean. So if that is the only ability you have to do that, then, then the landfill helps keep it out of the ocean. But obviously it's not the first choice. We prefer to capture that material and recycle it uh, sooner. Thank you. I'd like to have you comment on the prospect of uh, recycling plastic into synthetic uh, liquid or gaseous fuels. Sure. So what's the prospect of that? Sure. Um, I, that there's been a lot of research uh, poured into that recently. So pyrolysis, um, converting the plastics to fuel in places that need fuel um, and need plastic management, especially uh, people are looking at mobile units, doing that in islands where you don't have a lot of land space. It's a bit different. Um, well, I mean, it's it's very different than combustion, where you're going to have an ash res residue. Um, which is still a challenge to manage and has to be managed in a landfill. Um, and so I think pyrolysis is promising. It's, the challenges are that you often need a homogenous feedstock, which municipal solid waste is, is not usually, but maybe through um, this integrated waste management system ahead of time where you're source separating and looking at what you're using. Um, I think that needs to be in place first, I guess, also. So I don't think you should just look at that as like, oh, we can just start this technology and it'll solve it. You still need all those upstream changes to get the right feedstock um, to feed something like that as sort of the, the plastic management strategy. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Jambik. I think uh, that was quite an eye-opener for all of us. And I think uh, the present generation is far more conscious about the environment than we are. And the rate at which we are going, possibly we'll have more uh, plastic debris than fish in the oceans. So let us all take a pledge that we will reduce plastic usage and of course uh, the pollution that is being caused especially in the oceans. Thank you. We would now request uh, one of our senior most faculty members, Professor Goshami from the Department of Chemistry to present on our behalf a memento to Dr. Jambek.
fish animals that you do not need cows This is research topic that is uh, only way in biodegradable for human consumption experience and also microbial development. So we have a chap that has a specific consumption experience and human consumption. But recycling and control use is a must. You cannot throw plastics here. That's what uh, we need. I now request Professor Anirban Guptu to propose a vote of thanks. I think uh, we have already expressed a lot of thanks and gratitude to Professor Jambe, uh, Professor Aparna, Professor Goswami, they mentioned that. I think she will be happy as Aparna mentioned that we should take a place to reduce plastic pollution. Professor Jambe will be happier. If we also take a place that we'll be using that online app, mobile trash uh, tracker or something, she will be happy because as an engineer she mentioned again and again that she will be happy with the data generated. So I think uh, some of us will be trying and uh, we are really thankful that you have uh, delivered it on a very contemporary topic, dealt it from the source to what can be done, the science and the solutions. And for this year, as I mentioned initially also, for this year, the big plastic pollution, your speech is very relevant. And it makes us to think one more, once more that what can we do to help survival of the all species on the planet. Thank you very much so much. And we are also thankful to the US consulate because as you have understood that it is uh, for their uh, help we could get Professor Jambek. She is a world traveler, invited to so many countries in India in so many issues. So we are extremely thankful. She was Shishangupta is here, so we are thankful to her also that they have considered Ayashi Shippur for a promotional uh, lecture for Professor Jambek. Thank you very much.